Hello, and thank you for tuning into the Coos Health and Wellness Public Health Division COVID-19 Town Hall. If you've submitted questions via the COVID-19 email, we'll be answering those questions that will not be addressed during the presentation. If you submit questions via the live feed, we will be monitoring those and pulling questions as we go. We may not address all questions answered, but we will try to get to as many as possible in the time we have and work on answering some as time permits through the rest of this week. We do have a small audio delay in the event that the video feed drops. We will restart the video. I'd like to introduce the panel we will have tonight. Florence Portal Stevens, our public health director. Brian Leone, public health epidemiologist. Kelly Dion, chief quality officer from Bay Area Hospital. And we have Angela Mayfield, who will be our Spanish translator, as well as Barb Young, our ASL translator. So let me welcome Florence Portal Stevens, who will give our presentation. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for um, joining us tonight. Um, we uh, will go through a slight de desk about COVID-19, uh, trying to provide you with the latest information um, we have available to us at this point. So uh, first question, what is COVID-19? So we thought we would give you a little bit of background information. So as you may have heard, uh, this is a novel virus that was first identified in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. It is uh, thought to have originated from animal transmission. And as you may have heard, it is now considered a global outbreak as it has spread through um, many countries throughout the, the globe. It's a new virus or novel virus. Uh, so there is still a lot of things that we're learning about this virus. Um, however, it has some, um, some similarities with uh, other viruses we know of, like SARS and MERS. So how does it transmit? Uh, so we know now that it transmits from person to person and it transmits uh, like the flu or whooping cough. Um, so it is via respiratory droplets uh, produced when an infected person with COVID-19 coughs or sneezes without, you know, you know, like protecting them, themselves. Uh, what are the symptoms? <laughs> Um, so those symptoms are what we um, call flu-like symptoms, and they may include a fever, a sore throat, a dry cough, shortness of breath, muscle pain, and fatigue. Um, it is important to note that a fever may not be present in the very young, the very old, the people who are immunosuppressed, such as the people who have cancer or lupus or any other autoimmune condition, or people uh, who take fever that reduce, oh, sorry, medication that reduce fever. Um, the people that are most at risk are the elderly and the immunocompromised individuals. So um, what is the incubation period? Um, so pretty much um, how long does it take for 
the disease to express itself in the body. So it ranges um, between 2 to 14 days and um, the mean um, has been known to be 5 days after being exposed to someone who has COVID-19. So we thought we would give you a little bit of information as to what's been happening in Oregon. So as of yesterday, um, we knew um, of 14 confer well, presumptive, that should say here, presumptive positive cases in Oregon. So that means that those uh, cases have been um, tested positive by the Oregon State Public Health Lab and uh, not yet confirmed by the CDC. We do not have any positive case of COVID-19 in Coos County. At this point, six individuals have been tested in our community and the six results are negative. So the state lab um, has been able to handle testing for the past 10 days. And they have been working to uh, expand testing to private labs. We learned this morning um, that a few labs um, like Quest and LabCorp are now able to um, handle COVID-19 testing. Um, as you may or may not know, the Oregon Health Authority has been updating uh, statewide data on a daily basis, and this information is available on their website. The other thing that is happening in Oregon is that the public health system as a whole has been working really hard to not only educate the public, but also coordinate testing and response with the healthcare system and do a case contact investigation. So, <clears throat> who is most at risk for this disease? So what we know is that most people will experience mild flu-like symptoms. Um, the people who are the most at risk are older adults and um, people who are experiencing chronic conditions such as heart, lung, and or kidney disease. Those folks are twice as likely to experience severe symptoms of the disease. So what we recommend is that um, people who fall in that category avoid large gatherings and have minimum to no contact with sick people. Also, the recommendation from the medical officer from uh, the state of Oregon is that um, if you can, uh, you have prescription medication on hand. All right, so another question that we tend to receive is how do we prevent COVID-19 and other respiratory illnesses? So you'll see in the presentation, the bolded uh, parts have been um, recommended by the medical officer from the state yesterday. Um, important to cover your cough and sneeze with a tissue and then throw the tissue in the trash. You can also cover your cough and sneeze um, by coughing in your elbow. Uh, it is important that you wash your hands uh, often with soap and water for about uh, 20 seconds and if you don't want to count you can sing happy birthday twice and that would do it if you do not have access to soap and water um, you can use alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60 percent of alcohol we recommend that uh, you avoid close contact with people who are sick. 
that you also avoid touching your eyes, your nose and mouth with unwashed hands. It is also recommended that you clean and disinfect surfaces that are often touched and also that you take care of yourself overall and of your health. So it's important that you stay current on your vaccinations and if you haven't had a chance yet to be vaccinated for the flu, we recommend that you do that. It's important that you eat well and that you exercise if you can so that all those steps will help your body stay healthy and be resilient. So what can you do in terms of your own individual preparedness? So in case you know uh, you get sick and you need to stay home for a little bit, uh, it's, it's good to have, if you can, a stock of non-perishable food items on hand and possibly prescription medication and standard cleaning supplies. It's also very good that um, you refrain from purchasing medical grade personal protective equipment as healthcare providers need these. And so what I'm talking about here is, uh, you might have heard in the news media, uh, N95 masks and special eye protection. All of those are important equipment that we need to use to ensure that the healthcare providers who are taking care of our community are indeed protected when, if they handle a suspect case of COVID-19 and other communicable disease. You know, the other thing that is really good to do is to stay current with the latest updates and recommendations from the public health system. And just to remain calm and, and be prepared. So you may ask yourself, when is it, when is it a good time for me to seek treatment? So the first thing we want to put out there is that please uh, refrain from going to the emergency room unless you have a medical emergency. And the reason for this is that it's important that we keep the emergency rooms clear of non-medical emergencies so that the people who need the care and attention of the emergency room providers um, can get it. The second thing that we're asking you do is that you uh, call your provider uh, express the symptoms you're um, experiencing and follow their guidance. Most likely they're gonna ask you to stay home and to treat your symptoms as you would normally do. And that means get plenty of rest, drink a lot of fluids, and um, possibly take some over-the-counter medication. So what has our community been doing and especially your public health department been doing um, to ensure that our community is prepared and ready to handle a suspect case of um, COVID-19? So one, we've been developing protocols with our uh, healthcare systems partner for uh, handling suspect case that have been so we've, sorry, we've developed those protocols and, when, and we shared them with the healthcare system in the community as well as um, the emergency responders system. We've been having for the past six weeks um, a weekly strategic and update partners meeting that really includes a lot of um, community partners from law enforcement to the hospital system, the clinic system, first responder system, firefighters, uh, the school system, uh, the long-term care facilities, um, the community college, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some, some partners. Um, 
We've been also ensuring coordination of sampling and testing um, with the hospital and uh, healthcare providers. One of our uh, role as public health is to ensure that we're doing investigation and monitoring of any suspect case. We activated the Medical Reserve Corps so that our hospitals and partners have access to volunteers. We've placed a request for personal protective equipment and supplies for the whole county's healthcare and first responder system through what's called Op Center, which is the Oregon Emergency Management System. Um, we, of course, work very closely with the Oregon Health Authority to seek guidance and um, follow their lead. Uh, we have activated our emergency operations center and over the weekend we bagged some hygiene and prevention kits for the homeless population. <coughs> we've also uh, been serving as a point of contact for questions and so we've been fielding questions from hospitals, healthcare providers, the school system and of course the public. Um, and we've also um, tried to develop quite a lot of resources for public communication and education about uh, COVID-19. So we develop a specific page on our website uh, dedicated to COVID-19. There is also the COVID-19.questions email address that you're welcome to use anytime you have a question for us and we'll gladly answer it. We've also conducted a few interviews with our local media, the newspaper, KCBY, KeyEasyEye, and KDOC Radio. We're conducting this town hall virtually, and we'll have a presentation um, tomorrow to the North Bend City Council, and we also did a presentation last week to the Board of Commissioners uh, for the county, as well as the Coos Bay City Council. All right, so now is uh, time for questions. Yep, we're gonna open up to some questions. I'm gonna start with a question on our Facebook feed from Sandy that she says she heard that washing your hands with antibacterial soap isn't killing it. Is that true? <clears throat> well, that depends on exactly what is being used, um, but as far as we are aware of, the lipid layer that encases the virus is very, very susceptible to um, any type of soap, really. Uh, and so <clears throat> once that lipid layer is, is broken through, which is essentially what soaps do, um, then there should not be much of a risk of transmission. Thank you, Brian. So we have some questions that came from our COVID email address. Christy had a question said, for those of us who hope for the best, but plan for the worst, it seems logical that in this light, we should assume that everyone in the community is positive. And that would seem to me then that wearing masks as a protective measure in public spaces would be advised assuming that the N95 mask is being used and worn correctly. So masks are generally more about keeping you from transmitting disease to others, not protecting you from disease from others. So our healthcare workers need some of that uh, high grade medical grade uh, personal protective equipment because they're going to be having much more uh, in-person contact, contact with fluids. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen in a healthcare encounter uh, that is quite a bit more contact than say, you just walking past someone you know, on the street or, or in the store. So we definitely need to have um, a better understanding of exactly what the purpose of wearing masks, masks are for. Uh, it's much, less likely that you're going to breathe in someone's respiratory fluids than come into contact with your respiratory, others' respiratory fluids, and then touch your face and mouth. Awesome. 
And don't forget, if you're watching live, you can always post questions in the comment feed, and we will be monitoring those. Veronica has a two-part question. So I'll start with the first, then we'll go to the second for the panel. <coughs> so she's wondering why there aren't local testing options. That's a really good question. Um, there, there certainly has been some delays in expanding the testing process. Uh, currently, um, there, there has been some emergency use uh, testing available. Again, like I said, commercial labs have just now come online, um, you know, this last Friday and Monday, and hopefully that's going to expand further than that. Um, that is something we're certainly looking at, at trying to expand the testing availability uh, as soon as possible. Her, her second part of her question was, why is it taking so long to produce a test and what are the problems they're currently having to produce one? So I can take this one and then Brian, um, you're welcome to, uh, to jump in. Um, so just for a little bit of background on this, um, the test for COVID-19 has been available to the world since the beginning of 2000, February 2020. And um, United States government um, decided to not go with the test developed by the WHO and uh, develop their own test. One of the issue with that um, is that the, the test that was developed by the CDC um, was initially, initially flawed. Um, and so that delayed testing as well. And now there were, we are um, kind of late in the, in, the, in the game and in the process and uh, we're trying to um, Play catch up. Play catch up. Yes, pretty much is the answer. Uh, we have another question on our Facebook feed from Linda. So, is it true that money is transmitting the virus? Now, I assume that she means that something's like the germ on the bill. Can you right. speak to that? So, <clears throat> the virus can live on surfaces. Um, depending on various reports, anywhere from three to 12 hours, uh, probably about the average that we've been hearing about is up to nine hours on certain studies. Um, so it is plausible that someone, you know, can uh, have respiratory droplets on the money and then hand the money to someone else. And, and then that person, once again, touches those droplets and then later touches their face. So uh, that's a perfect example of why, you know, we're recommending that everyone wash their hands if they haven't and only touch your face when your hands are washed. That's great. Uh, another question online, we have two very similar questions. Uh, Cole and Alicia are asking maybe about plans to close schools if we have a case in our area. So thank you for the question. Um, like I mentioned in the presentation, you know, we've been in very close contact uh, with the school system uh, in the county. Um, in the event we have a a case in the community, you know, um, our primary role as public health is going to is going to do an investigation and make sure that um, we are tr tracking all of the places and and person that the the case has been in contact with. If um, you know that person has been in contact with a child who uh, has been going to school, then we will definitely consider. Uh, not only um, having a conversation with that particular school and um, possibly recommending uh, closing at least for a temporary period of time to ensure like proper disinfection of the establishment. So this is, you know, um, definitely on our radar. Uh, there is some guidance coming out from the CDC and the state of Oregon. Um, so we uh, will definitely handle those uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. But thank you for the question. That's a, that's a good one. So uh, when it comes to providing uh, guidance to like schools and the employers of the area, 
Is that something that Coos Health and Wellness plans to do? So uh, thank you, Eric. So if you uh, were to go on our uh, website and on the COVID-19 uh, page, you'll find that the, this guidance has already been posted. It's guidance that is coming uh, directly from the CDC. Uh, and there is guidance for employers, individuals and families, uh, childcare and schools, community colleges, uh, businesses. So you have all those uh, guidance from the CDC and there is also uh, a link to the Oregon Health Authority page. And on that page, uh, they did a lot of work over the weekend and put a lot of um, newer guidance as well uh, for um, um, all of those organizations you mentioned. I got, some, I got two really just wonderful questions on the page here. Uh, is that uh, Mar Mar Margana, Mar Margana um, asks the Cluse Bay Clam Bake Jazz Festival is this weekend. Their website says to check with Coos Health and Wellness for updates. And as of Friday, it's still scheduled. Now, I'm under the impression that a significant amount of these jazz festival goers would be in that susceptible age group of the 60 and over. So I think what the, I think they're asking what what your thoughts are on that as a plan going forward. Well, I think at this point there there is no recommendation uh, from us as the public health department to close that event. Has there no case? in our community. However, I'm gonna point you back out to the presentation in one of the earlier points, that is if you, um, you know, to huge, to huge um, personal judgment, right? And, and really like decide for yourself. And if you feel like you're in the older adult category and that doesn't feel very comfortable to you to go to that event, then do not go. It will be here next year. There was some guidance on the video from today that OHA put out that just said basically the same thing. And if you're feeling sick, don't go anywhere, stay home. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, as you said, people will take that judgment into account. And they're like, eh, maybe, I, maybe I'll stay home. Um, I had another question <laughs> about healthcare workers that do home visits. For instance, babies first and cocoon project nurses, they go from house to house. What are the risks for both workers and families? Like I said, um, there are no cases of COVID-19 in our community at this point. Um, so, you know, our nurses are extremely well-trained and they're well aware of, you know, um, basic, uh, prevention steps, um, they um, wash their hands on, uh, on a regular basis and um, will make sure when they schedule their appointment or confirm their appointment with the families they are visiting that um, the people are not sick. If they're sick, they will be rescheduling the, the, the appointment. Kim Singh asked, uh, she had read about the possibility of two separate COVID-19 viruses, L, which is supposed to be more aggressive, and the S, which is more mild. Is there any validity to that? I, I don't know that there's evidence to support that yet. Um, if there are reports out there, that is definitely something we would look into uh, validating and, and vetting. Uh, but as far as information from the CDC that we have right now is um, we're just dealing with one particular virus. There are people that say, go get your flu shot and that's going to help you not get COVID-19. What are... And, and those people will be, uh, would be ill-informed at this point. There are uh, no vaccines. Uh, for COVID-19 at this point of time. There are a lot of people uh, everywhere in the world uh, who are working really hard to uh, find one. 
and uh, make one available to all of us. Uh, but at this point, there is no vaccine to prevent uh, from COVID-19. And the flu vaccine is preventing from the flu. So spring break is coming. What are your thoughts about travel during such a very popular time to travel? Well, uh, information obviously is being updated all the time, uh, but you know, so we certainly want to encourage everyone to stay updated, uh, particularly about cases that are discovered in possible destinations. Um, but at this stage, again, we're not really willing to blanketly offer advice that says, you know, you should cancel your trip plans or cancel your events or, or anything of that nature. We want to be realistic in the fact that there certainly is the possibility that this will spread further and we will certainly evaluate at that point and continue to give guidance. And so I think uh, to add to um, what Brian was saying, important to keep in mind the precaution practices that we discussed earlier, wash your hands often, cover your cough, stay away from people who are sick. Yes. Okay. So in regards to... Can, can you contract COVID-19 more than once? Can you have it, get better, and then get it again? That, that is a really, really good question. Uh, there have been some news reports uh, about some individuals, not here in the US, um, but individuals elsewhere that have gotten ill and then gotten better and then tested negative and then become ill again. Um, but these, from what I'm aware, are, are very rare circumstances to the point that they have not been validated um, and so I, I wouldn't be willing to say it's impossible, but uh, that's not something we're currently 100% concerned about. Uh, a lot of people receive packages from Amazon from overseas. I know that we've said that they're, we believe that it is dead after nine hours, 12 hours. Does anybody have to worry about anything that they order in the mail that comes from overseas? At this point, there is no evidence to believe that the virus would remain on surfaces for more than 12 hours and it takes longer than 12 hours to go from a facility in China to a home in the United States. So, and I've heard this, uh, I've seen this on Facebook and I've heard people ask about this. Can you get COVID-19 from food, like Chinese food? So the theoretically, it, it is possible for uh, a virus to be transmitted on food as a vehicle, but that is not something that is, certainly there's no evidence to suggest that anyone has gotten it as a, as a foodborne illness. Uh, in regards to the Chinese food question specifically, I think it's very, very important to understand at this time that this virus is not any respecter of race or creed or language spoken. We are all susceptible to this virus. So it's fair to say that this virus does not discriminate? Absolutely 100% fair to say that, yes. Now this was a animal born virus, right? Does that mean that you can get it from your pets in the event that you were in an affected area? It, it's difficult to say. We're, we're unsure how many uh, animal to human transmissions there were. Uh, we're not 100% clear on which species of animal uh, there are, but I do know that some of the guidance that we've received is anyone that is self-isolating uh, includes their, their pets in that category. So not necessarily sure that we could get it from our pets, but we're also not sure that we couldn't make our pets sick if we were ill with COVID-19. So question that we've uh, received uh, 
was, are we currently testing or monitoring anybody with COVID-19 in our area? Um, not at this point. We have been. All the results have returned negative. Um, let's see, let's go through these questions. So stores are out of masks and sanitizers. What would, what would the average individual do now? If they want to try to find a hand sanitizer with 60% or more alcohol, but there isn't any, what is the, the procedures going forward for those people? to be washing their hands very frequently with soap and water. This thing. It says it was shut down it's in two minutes. So I, I, shut down. I tried to stop it from the back room. Can you? Yeah, I did, but I'm not 100% sure it's going to stop it. OK. Um, what is the right to do it right now? I could, I just don't know. It's already been set in place, so Let's see. Technical stuff. You keep going. Okay. Where is it? Where is it? Uh, what is the what is the current risk level in Coos County or in Oregon in general? Without a confirmed case, I would still uh, qualify that as low risk. Um, but again. It's something that we're prepared for to change and update anytime. And so we're, we're certainly wanting to make sure that you have those updates uh, as soon as possible should that change. We had a, a question on the Facebook feed. It said, would it be advisable, especially for, for older individuals, and, and he does, just to get the flu and pneumonia vaccines just so that they ensure that those are already possibly ruled out because it obviously doesn't prevent COVID-19 but to fortify against secondary respiratory infections which could be fatal. Yeah, um, comorbidities or, or having multiple illnesses at once would, would certainly make someone's ability to be resilient to COVID-19 more difficult. So, right, even though we've dis discussed already that the flu shot is not going to protect you against COVID-19, um, there's nothing that says you can't get the flu and COVID-19, so uh, protecting yourself against the flu and giving yourself that much of a better chance at being as healthy as you can be for you to become infected uh, would, 